Hello and welcome to episode 3 of Playing Pretend with Chris McIlvenny. This week I'm joined by Raymond Walsh. Raymond, uh, you'll hear a story, it's absolutely incredible. He didn't even know whether he was going to do musical theatre. He did a university degree in Jordanstown, ended up on the West End in Les Mis and then got asked to do the Les Mis All-Star Concert work with Alfie Bow, Michael Ball. Uh, Carrie Hope Fletcher, Matt Lucas, unbelievable, the list goes on. Uh, it's a, a great episode. Uh, it's great to get that insider scoop to uh, what goes on in the West End. So hope you enjoy this. This is Raymond Walsh. So Raymond, thanks very much for doing this. I really appreciate it. How you doing? Yeah, not too bad. I mean, uh, same old, same old at this stage, like, so uh, getting it. by. Okay, getting through that Netflix, uh, like, no tomorrow, I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, I think I could go represent people in court with the amount of murder mysteries I've watched at this stage. So uh, the law degree is coming, that's for sure. That's it. Um, uh, no, normally I start this by saying how we first met, but we've never actually really met. I served you in the Devonish once and it was just after watching Les Mis and I was oh, so yeah. tempted to say to you, ah, oh, Raymond, blah, blah, blah. I think you had Les Mis, but uh, I thought against it because in case my Guinness wasn't very good, so... I no, I, mean, I have stuff. to say, the Guinness was top notch, and uh, it sort of it doesn't surprise me that the place that you recognize me from is a bar. <laughs> so <laughs> that sort of sums it all up at this stage. Like, Fair. so I just wanted to start by uh, asking you how you got into acting, how you got into singing, uh, where did it come about? Was it from an early age? Because I know your family are quite musical. Your dad was in a band, uh, he plays the bass. Isn't your dad a bass player? Yes, yeah, he plays the bass. He plays a bit of piano as well, like, but yeah, I primarily he played bass, yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, how did uh, this um, career come about? It's sort of through lots of, like, loops, essentially. I uh, I always wanted to be in a boy band, so I loved Westlife growing up. Um, seen Westlife, like, eight, nine times in concert, and that was always the thing, like, you know old girlfriends used to buy me Westlife tickets for Christmas and people would always think it was the other way around. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so I always wanted to be in a boy band. Uh, but I played football a lot when I was younger, so I could never really sign up to any societies. And then uh, my sister was involved with a youth group and uh, they needed someone to come and operate the spotlight essentially on their production of Les Mis. So I'd never seen a musical before or even really heard of musical theater as an art form. I used to do like my own sort of silly videos online. So I always enjoyed acting and I enjoyed singing separately, but I didn't really know they came together. So uh, I went and operated the spotlight for a week and I was like, oh my God, this thing's class. Like loads mm -hmm. of great tunes. Uh, I just thought the art form was amazing. Um, and I knew that they were looking for boys to join their chorus. So I couldn't rehearse during the week or on Saturdays because of football. So I used to always sort of come in during tech week and just sort of stand at the back and mm -hmm. uh, shout my head off at that stage. So, I mean, it's, I, I never really thought it would be at that stage, whether it would be a career of mine or not. Um, and then, yeah, I ended up doing a degree in communication, advertising and marketing at Jordan's time. And then while doing that, I was still doing the shows and uh, I started to get singing lessons and stuff to see if anything could happen from it. And I entered a competition in London, I think when I was 18, 19, to sort of find uh, the best young musical theater performer in the UK that wasn't the drama school or wasn't really doing anything. And again, I didn't really you know, think much of it, but very fortunately, I managed to win it. Um, and then after that, I just remember the judges saying to me, you know, Raymond, you should really be thinking about trying this as a career. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I did a master's at, uh, in musical theatre at the Guildford School of Acting in 2011. And thankfully, haven't really looked back ever since. But it was one of those things. I mean, you'll know yourself, Chris, like... I don't think there's an awful lot. It's getting better, but there's not an awful lot of encouragement for young people in Northern Ireland to pursue a career in the arts. Yeah. It's always seen as, you know, you should be getting a job uh, as a lawyer or a doctor, or, you know, you should be getting a good, solid, steady job. And certainly when I was in school and I was, people used to sort of take the mickey out of me as, 
oh, your boy Raymond Walsh just wants to be famous. But I just enjoyed doing it. So yeah, uh, yeah it was uh, lots of bends along the way, like, but got there just a bite in the end. Yeah. Well, that that youth group you were talking about, it was Fusion, um, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I joined Fusion, I think it was 2013, and the show that they were doing was Les Mis. So I oh, think that was the third time they had done it. Yeah. And uh, it, it was it was a similar thing. I wasn't really that into musical theatre. And I, so I knew I wanted a, a chance to get on stage because I knew I wanted to be an actor. But unfortunately mm-hmm. here, there's not really an option to just do acting. You have to do musical theatre. If you want a chance yeah, to be on yeah. stage in front of people, that's what you got to do. So I heard that they were doing Les Mis and, and someone told me that you will have to like audition type of thing to get in to the chorus. So learn the songs. But I'm I'm kind of like a, a perfectionist. So I watched the 25th anniversary of Les Mis and yeah. just learned every single word, to every single, the whole thing. I just knew it off by heart. So then yeah. I got I got the, the rehearsals and they were like, uh, so w- they did the first act because they were just learning the parts at that stage. Mm-hmm. So they were going through and then I, I, they had a break. So the guy called me up and was like, yeah, we're just going to do a few scales. It was like, la, 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 la. Yeah, you're in. I was like, ah, what? I just learned the whole show <laughs> for no reason. But yeah, uh, yeah that, that's when I fell in love with it. And I, see, to be fair, I always wanted, after that, I always wanted a career in musical theatre, but my voice is quite deep, as you can probably tell. I'm a bass. And I yeah. always thought, I was like, well, as a bass, you don't really get the lead parts. Uh, unless you're a tenor, you don't get the lead parts. So I always use the example, in West Side Story, I could never play Tony, but in Romeo and Juliet, I could play Romeo. So yeah. Uh, so then that, that was it. Uh, so then, so so how did th- th- it come about doing the Masters? Uh, wh- so you had finished the, the CAM course and then yeah. you went on to do the Masters? Yeah, I sort of, by about second year in uh, Jordanstown, I sort of made the decision, right, once I get this out of the way, I'm going to go and have a go at musical theatre. And like, I mean, I remember going in for my finals in uh, the CAM course and people in my class going, oh my God, Raymond, we thought you dropped out. Because I think in my final year, I only went in to three lectures in the entire year. Because at that stage, I'd lost a bit of interest. And I was very lucky. I sort of have like a photographic memory. So it always meant that before exams, I could just read an essay and just remember it. So by about second year, I knew I was going to have a go at it. And uh, I, at the time at the Royal Academy, the head of the Royal Academy for Masters of Musical Theatre was the head judge on that competition. So she had told me, look, you can come and do a Masters here afterwards if you want. And it was only when I went to visit my friend, another Northern Irish actor, Turla Convery. I don't, do you, would you know Turla? No, um, no, I don't know him. Well, Turla, Turla did Fusion as well, and we would have grown up working together, but Turla was at Guildford at the time, and I went to visit him. And I just fell in love with the place. I just thought the school was amazing. It was a new building. And uh, yeah, I just really loved it. And now Turla, to be fair, is probably the most uh, successful actor I'm friends with. Turla is like in Ready Player One with Steven Spielberg. Oh. He's in Pull Dark. And then he, ironically, he played Grant Hare. And you know, they, they did the Les Mis television adaption? Yes. Recently, he's Grant Hare in that. Wow. So at the time I was doing Grant Hare, in the West End musical, he was playing Grant Terre in the, the BBC TV show. So it was weird to sort yeah, of... Yeah, that is crazy. So so out. then when you finished the Masters, did you stay in London? Because I know Guildford's a little bit out of London, but did, did you stay in London then? Yeah, I moved into Tooting in uh, 2012 um, with another lad, uh, Will Jennings, um, who actually I ended up doing the he was in the Les Mis concert with me recently so we hadn't mm. seen each other really since school and then we came back to do it together but yeah moved in and then I was lucky I came straight out of drama school and went into a new hard good old musical uh, A Winter's Tale um, and I, another Northern Irish actor Fra Fee Fra was mm. in that um, and yeah, I just sort of kept auditioning and doing bits and bobs, like, but you know yourself, it's just one, it's just a long slog. And I mean, during my time in London, 
I could name you about 16 different part-time jobs that I did, like selling photography on Oxford Street to people to selling advertising spaces in West End programs of the shows I wanted to be in. Yeah. But instead, I was ringing people up going, oh, your bakery is around the corner from Matilda. Do you want the place <laughs> in the programs? You know, yeah. but you've got to do what you got to do to survive, I guess. That's it. I think London uh, is such a good place to be if that's the industry that you want to be in because it just seems like everything's happening. There's so much theatre happening. You could walk down the street and there's a movie being filmed and you're like, I want to do that. And you can't yeah. really go up and be like, here, do you need someone to do that part? Because I could do it. Uh, you can't really do that. So um, it London is like the hub kind of of everything. So especially yeah. being from Belfast, because it's quite a, a small city. It's mm. London's just like a different world. Uh, so why, why, while you were in London, did you get a chance to, to go to many theatre shows? Yeah, I mean, I, I was always uh, trying my best to go and see... Uh, as much theatre as possible and uh, make connections and you know I, I, was, I was lucky I had a brilliant brilliant circle of friends in London and uh, you know got to meet some really cool people and you know I always managed to wangle my way into just random events mm -hmm. like you know I remember being at Star Trek premiere because mm -hmm. a friend of mine was dating one of the lead actresses and we got to go to that and uh but it was always it was always last minute. You always sort of you know. And another great one was um, for a while I was doing like a Jersey Boys tribute that used to do like guest entertaining on cruise ships. And I remember being out for lunch one day and getting a phone call from one of the boys, being like, "Lads, uh, Arsenal Football Club have just got in contact. It's their end of season dinner, and Lulu has pulled out from singing at it. Will you boys come and sing at it?" And we were like, right. So we had to literally leave that lunch in London, jump into a taxi, get to the Emirates Stadium. And then two hours later, like I've got to I'll show you to get the photo for you. Like, yeah. um, I hope you're not an Arsenal fan, though. No, I'm a Man United fan. Good mm, stuff. But, uh, there's like me with the Arsenal team and then myself and Arsene Wenger. But it was just one of those. It was one of those things that it sort of just happened in the space of a couple of hours. So that's the sort of thing I always tell people about London is that, you know, a click of a finger and you never know the possibilities are endless. Like, yeah, but, uh, it is a tough. It's a tough city as well. Like, it can get Absolutely, very Absolutely, Yeah. Yeah. Um, because when I when I lived there, I I, I just finished drama school because it, it is that that high. I just finished drama school. I'd done a play in Liverpool. And then there's this thing called Spotlight Prize. So it's like the top 20 drama school yeah, graduates. Yeah. In, in the UK and Ireland so I got that well I like I was one of the top 20 and I was like this is it like this is I'm gonna get this and I'm gonna be on Netflix and I'm gonna be on the West End and it doesn't really work out that way and then no, you, not. you take the jump you move to London and then you're like oh, shit, I, I actually have to get a job I have to work yeah. here at a bar and serve decent pints of Guinness yeah <laughs> yeah so then so how so you were working uh in, in a few shows in London and obviously doing the, the Jersey Boys tribute. So then how did Les Mis come about? Oh, that's a really random one. I, I sort of, I I'd auditioned for it years and years and years ago. And I remember my agent saying to me, oh Raymond, it looks like they're gonna offer you a swing. And I was like, oh, amazing. I just, it was my dream show. It's what I went to London for. And then she rang me up like a week later saying, actually Raymond, the swings decided to stay on. And I was like, oh, so I was gutted. But then I did an audition or get an audition for Les Mis for like five years after that. And, you know, for two, three years, I'd more or less just been doing the guest entertaining work, like going on the cruise ships for a week at a time and mm -hmm. traveling and seeing the world. And I thought, oh, do you know what? I, I've had a brilliant time. I'm going to move back home. So I got all my stuff into a car and drove up and broke down in Liverpool and had to stay in Liverpool four nights while my car got fixed. And then I finally, I got on the boat and came home to start up my band, the Shamrock Tenors. And I shot the, the promo, I'm doing all that. And like, I'd only been home for a week and my agent phoned me and was like, oh, Raymond, Les Mis want to see you. And I was like, oh. And it, there's something just inside me went, you've gone to all this effort of moving everything back home and you've been home for a week. I was like, this is gonna be the time. So. 
uh, yeah, I mean, I was flying back and forth for the additions. Uh, and I remember in the second round getting sent the Tenardier material. And I was like, see, I don't look that rough, do you? I was like, oh my God. I said, things, I am not aging very well. But anyway, that, so I was going back and forward. And then the last round of additions uh, went into the theatre, which was the Queen's at the time. It's now the song time. And you walk onto the stage and all the producers and directors and mu- are sat in the stalls and Cameron McIntosh is there and they're all just watching you and they're like, okay, Raymond, we'll hear the first verse of Master of the House or whatever and all. And you're just like, oh my God. Um, I always thought that just happened in movies that you auditioned on the stage of the theatre and they sit in the stalls. That's crazy that that actually happened. Yeah, that that was, you start off, the lame is finals. So the final round, you go in as a big group of lads and you workshop uh, ABC Cafe and you know, have a bit of a play about it and then everyone goes outside and then you go in one by one and walk onto the stage and uh, you know audition and you just see all these slight outlines in the audience. But anyway, yeah, I went in and auditioned for that and did bits and bobs and came out afterwards and I sort of got the impression from all the lads there that there was only two or three people at that stage in for the same sort of uh, rules I was in for. So I thought, oh, well, I'm in for a 33% chance here. So then I went back to Belfast and I was in, well, I was in Pure Gym in Lisburn, actually. <laughs> I can remember a clear as day mm-hmm. and I was on the squat rack. Me and my brother were doing some squats and my phone went and I looked down and it was my agent and I thought, right, I better take this. And they were like, yeah, Raymond, the, you've got Les Mis, the one they offer you Grant Air and they want to offer you first cover to Nardier. And I was like, first cover to Nardier? I was like, can you go back and do double check that and they were like yeah I thought that was a bit strange so they went back and checked and came back and were like no it is it's the first cover and I was like so I've been cast as a drunk student and I've been cast as a cover drunk innkeeper I was like uh, there's typecasting and then there's typecasting that's it they've seen your CV and went Irish okay the two drunks will give him them points. yeah yeah I know why yeah, that's funny so so uh, for some people who maybe don't know what first cover means so you you every night you would play Grand Terre, but yeah. if if the person who plays Tenardier can't make the performance, do you then step in as Tenardier and someone else takes your part as Grand Terre? Yes, yes. So there was two covers for Grand Terre. Um, because you've got swings, essentially a swing covers all of in Les Mis, they cover all of the male students except for Grand Terre, and then Grand Terre has two covers from within uh, the company, and then every principal essentially has two covers except for Valjean who has three mm-hmm. um but yeah so because it's a year-long contract you get 28 days uh of the year holiday so if you're a first cover you're guaranteed those 28 days mm-hmm. and then the rest of the time is like if people are off ill or they have any bereavements or you know various bits and bobs kind of thing mm-hmm. but yeah so uh yeah, I think in the end I got to play Tenardier 70 times, I think, wow. which was a real, like, you know, I was very fortunate in that sense because obviously you get double show days and Steve, who was playing Tenardier, unfortunately, he got kidney stones at one stage. Right. So he was out for like a week. Um, but it just meant, yeah, I, I, remember, I actually broke a bone or a ligament in my foot as Tenardier right. because I came down wearing his high heels for my boy. Like, it's not even during the show. I went down to buy and my heel went beneath me and I ripped a ligament in my foot. So I was off work for like two and a half weeks. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's mad. So that's that's the reason you have covers in case idiots like myself tear tendons <sighs> taking a buy. That's it. You never, anything can happen. No, it's wild. So, so then, so you had a, a year contract and that was as part of the original production still? Yes. So, so yeah. then, had your year ran out when they decided that they were going to uh, renovate the Queen's Theatre, move to the Gilgood, and do the All Star concert? Well, no. So basically, the year ran out and they knew they were going to renovate. So they had to get an extension to take it up to the, to the concert. So that it, I think, so that Les Mis didn't lose the title of longest running musical, mm. they had to have it as a seamless transition so uh they uh added a additional 12 weeks on to our first contract Mm -hmm. and then 
when that finished, there was a week's gap, and then we started rehearsals for the the concert next door. It's crazy. So it was a it was a lot of lame is if you think <laughs> watching it. that twenty fifth made you learn the words. I actually would think I could sing them in my sleep. It goes through me sometimes. Like I can imagine. So then, so then. Obviously, it's a dream come true. Being in Les Mis on the West End, like, that's incredible. Being a part of still the original production. So yeah. then when they said to you that you were going to be in the All-Star concert with all the big names that were going to be in that concert, like, what was that like? Yeah, insane. I, I can, again, I can always remember these things. They sort of stick in your head when they happen. But I was in warm-up for the um the in the original and I knew that like a week beforehand I was on as Tenardier and Cameron McIntosh had come to see the show like he just happened to be in the audience that night so I, I was bricking myself but I thought right if I give a good account to myself you know maybe I'll get into the concert or maybe and then I was in I was in warm-up as I say a week later and the resident director came up to me and just said have you had a phone call yet and I was like no and he was just like, look, expect a phone call. And I was like, okay, we'll see what this is about. Um, and I knew at that stage, some people had been contacted about the concert and they were putting bits and pieces together. Um, and then, yeah, no, my agent then just phoned me and was like, Raymond, you've been offered Grand Terre in the concert. And I was like, oh my God, I couldn't believe it. But uh, yeah, it really was. Because I, as I say, like yourself watching the 25th, I'm a bit older, obviously. So <laughs> the first one I seen was the, the 10th anniversary. Yeah. yeah. And obviously watching Michael Ball and uh, then to be working with him, you know, 24 years later was just like very, very surreal. Like, but yeah, uh, yeah no, it was amazing. I was absolutely buzzing. And uh, as I can't actually say nice enough words about all the people that, you know, you, you always hope that the, these big stars and stuff are nice and live up to their reputation kind of thing. And uh, all things considered, they were the loveliest bunch of people like. So no, they, always yeah. say, they always say never meet your heroes, but um, yeah. surely it was like, obviously it's surreal being in that production. You're working with Michael Ball, but the moment that would, obviously you're doing it night after night, but the moment that would just be ridiculous for me is sitting on the stage behind Alfie Bo or John Owen Jones, either way, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Sing and bring him home. That, I, that would kill me off. I'm a very emotional person, so I, I would be able to hold it together. Uh, surely that yeah. was just mental. Yeah, it was, it was insane. I mean, I've got... The, the, the real moment that sticks out for me was the sets probe. We were rehearsing at the new uh, Royal Opera House's um, rehearsal space. Uh, no, was it the Royal National Ballet? No, sorry, Royal National Ballet's new rehearsal space. And they brought in, because the orchestra was like 36 pe like people in the orchestra. It was a huge, huge orchestra. And we all got into this big room. And during the sits probe, when I got to bring him home, uh, John and Alfie both stood up and sang it as a duet. Oh, so obviously, there's no footage of that. I have footage. I've recorded it on my phone. So I have this secret footage. But that was a moment. I remember my mate, Karen was sat next to me and he was just weeping his eyes out at the idea of those two. Yeah, um, but yeah, they were phenomenal, phenomenal. Like it really was sort of a, a pinch yourself moment. And it was great because in the concert, because the orchestra were behind us, it meant that the front row was a meter, two meters from oh, us yeah. on the stage. So you could watch everyone just, the audience just break down in tears. It was mm -hmm. like, a, that was the most exciting part of the concert actually was watching the audience that was just seeing them go through the journey and seeing the 34 years on this musical is still as relevant and as emotional as ever well that's it because uh as opposed from being in the musical as as it originally is you obviously mm. go off stage when it's not your part but in the concert you just get to sit back and, and you watch from behind, but obviously you're watching the audience. That's unbelievable. Well, you say that, but, you know, eight shows a week, 16 <laughs> yes. weeks. I mean, yeah. and also the benches were so uncomfortable. They were just wooden benches. So you're back. And um, there was only, I think the girls got to go off and have a break. 
uh, all the principals obviously got to go off and have a break, but there was just like the group of lads who had to be on from start to finish. We were all coming off every night, like going to have to see a chiropractor or something. <laughs> but no, yeah. it's still okay. no, it still was. And I'm joking in the sense of saying it, it still was amazing. Like, and it was mm-hmm. you never got tired of hearing it. But I mean, it's a long show. It's it uh, is, yeah. three hours, uh, so it was wild. So that concert version was released, uh, like on the like Amazon and stuff like uh, digital platforms, and it was yeah. just at the start of the first lockdown. And I remember, yes. like, I I've like I've I haven't watched it as much as you, but I've watched Lame Is the Death, and I, I love mm. it. It's my favorite, uh, my second favorite. Phantom's my my number one. But yeah. um, when I watched that, I was just like, that is perfectly sung. It, it couldn't be sung any better. Every single part is perfectly sung. It was just incredible. But what I found interesting was you're playing Grand Terre in the French Revolution. You have a Northern Irish accent. Uh, yeah. What well, I think there? From, their, from their point of view, they were just sort of like, well, Canardier's always played as a cockney, you know, like... It, at the end of the day, like it's they're just sort of like like it's musical theater. They're like it's meant to transcend, you know, conventional. Like people are singing. There's no speaking in the show. Yeah. Um. And then the, I just remember them saying to me at the start of rehearsals because I I rehearsed Grand Terre in an English accent, which again probably wouldn't make sense in France, but <laughs> I rehearsed it in an English accent. And they were just like, no, no, Raymond. They're like your natural accent is so brilliant. They were like just use it and it was the same as Tenardier uh when I was rehearsing yeah. Tenardier I was doing them Cockney and they were like no Raymond they're like let's have the first ever Northern Irish Tenardier so it was all like welcome monsieur set yourself down and meet the best and keeper in time you know it was That's all that. um they I don't know they always they just loved it but it was funny when you left stage door and there'd be crowds or whatever you would always hear in the crowd Where's your wee boy from Belfast? Like, <laughs> oh, yeah. You always knew when the Belfast ones were in. Oh, I go crazy. A big you. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Love that. So, when you were doing the concert, uh, there was obviously like famous people coming to see the show all the time because yeah. I, I think the All Star concert, that and Hamilton at that time were the most sought out tickets in town. Yeah, uh, mental. So the, uh, surely you met a lot of famous people. It, it didn't stop at uh, Arsene Wenger. Uh, uh, what type of people would come to see that concert? Uh, you know, it, I mean, it was because you forget about obviously like the likes of you know, all of Michael, Alfie, Carey, Matt. You know, every day you just sort of had people coming in that you didn't really, yeah. you'd never really met before. Like I mean, uh, I remember Shirley Bassey was there. Um, again, Matt Lucas ironically to go full circle that time we sang at the arsenal concert matt was the compare so i'd met he's a massive arsenal fan so he again he'd loads of arsenal players coming to watch it um uh david williams was in uh yeah you always you had everyone come in but i mean the coolest part for me in terms of meeting famous people and stuff was that on the concert we had claude michelle schoenberg in rehearsals every single day so he he was sat teaching us the music and he was saying why he'd written certain things and you know I always tell people there's a great story of on opening night we obviously we came out and stage door on the original was busy but because of the celebrities stage door on the concert was insane like absolutely insane so you'd come out and try to get out and I remember I was just signing a few programs and stuff and I had this big hand on my shoulder and I was like, what? I turned around, it was Claude Michel Schoenberg. And he's just like, give me a kiss in the cheeks, and very French. And he was just like, Raymond, that was brilliant tonight. I'll see you next door for a drink because we were all having drinks next door. And then he walked off and no one was stopping him. And I was said to the people that sent the programs, I was like, why are you getting me? I was like, that's Claude Michel Schoenberg that's just walked past. And they were like, what, what, what? And I was like, "You fools! You fools!" <laughs> oh, yeah, but yeah, working with him for me was the was the highlight of the whole. Because I say this, the show meant has meant so much to me, and I wouldn't be doing what I do without it. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, yeah, having him sit in rehearsals and you know the bit at the start, the chain gang, the ah uh-huh, ah uh-huh, he was like, "No, no, no! It has to be ah uh-huh, ah uh-huh. 
they're pulling chains and like you're here that from the man himself you're just like how have i landed in this position like but yeah it was class yeah because I, I feel like maybe after a while you you almost become a little bit complacent and and start taking it for granted and then maybe sometimes there's just points where you're like oh no hold on there's carrie hope fletcher and alfie bow having a conversation and i'm on stage with them like and yeah. Claude Michelle Schoenberg has asked me for a drink after the show. Like that, I suppose that never gets old. No, you always realize that you sort of rolled the dice and won the lottery. Like, you know, it's just uh, every day I die, the luckiest, luckiest guy around. Like, and uh, I couldn't be more grateful to be, as I say, like, you know, to, to be on like a, a Les Mis cast album and movie and DVD that hopefully one day young people in the position I was in when I was younger or watching it and going, oh, I'd love to do that. You know, uh, hugely, hugely grateful for the opportunity. Like, and, uh, you know, it's one of those shows that I, I would always love to go back to at some stage just because it is so amazing. Yeah, that, that, incredible. Love it. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about Shamrock Tenors. Yes. Um, so that is uh, yourself and your brother and a few of your mates. Um, yeah. And... Uh, how how did that come about? Did you just want to... You'd done London, you decided to come back and start this band, uh, and then what happened? Yeah, again, basically, it came about because, as I was saying earlier, you know, in London, you're having to pick up all these in-between jobs and stuff, and I'd be, I'd been, a group of my mates started the Jersey Boys group, and, you know, they were doing well and getting onto the cruise ships, and I thought, I've never really seen an Irish group does traditional Irish music going on these ships and I thought oh there's a real gap in the market for it so and I knew this group of amazingly talented lads from back home and I thought oh, well, you know they're still at home and they're super talented I'd love to be able to give them the opportunity to go showcase that around the world so I just sort of uh, I said to Jack at the time my brother was just like look Jack do you fancy giving me a hand with this? We'll go shoot a promo for it. I'll see if I can get us, uh, you know, a cruise ship agent. And uh, I mean, like, as a start, I've got to be honest, it was only really a business idea, essentially, mm -hmm. to try and do, like, a, a Celtic women male version for mm -hmm. the cruise ships. Um, and then it just sort of... I obviously got Les Mis straight away, so the lads were off doing all the ships and stuff, sort of getting practice together as a band. Um, and then we organized a gig for when I finished Les Mis. We organized our first gig at home at Lisburn at the uh, uh, Lagan Valley Island and th got a live band together and thought, oh, we'll see what happens. And then the reaction, that was January of 2020. Jeez Louise, mm -hmm. the start before all this happened. But yeah, the reaction was amazing. So it sort of spiraled from there. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's sort of taken on its own momentum at the minute to the point now where for the next couple of years, I don't know whether I'll be able to commit to doing anything other than the band. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll see. But yeah, as I said, it, it started off as a business idea that was that would hopefully allow me in between jobs to still have work. And then now it's sort of hopefully going to become its own thing altogether. But Again, you never know. I never a year ago I wouldn't have believed you that there was a pandemic. So you know, I, that's it. And I'm gonna happen. Um, can happen. So uh, I see. I'm a sucker for a good harmony, and the way in which you've um, made these songs, like because they are traditional songs, yeah. like you've yeah. got Grace, Red as the Rose, uh, Whiskey in the Jar, but the they're almost presented in a musical theatre way. Uh, yeah. with the harmonies the male harmonies and I feel like that's something that's never been done before or they those songs at least have never been sung like that so it's a real uh, it, it's a real treat to be able to go see a show like that because I know you are doing uh you are doing tickets for uh, a pre-recorded concert for St Patrick's Day yes yeah no um we we shot that in December so the Ulster Hall had been given a grant by the Arts Council to basically put on some streamed shows. So we went in um, and brought in all of our own sort of crew, our own camera team. Jack, my brother, he went to film school in Los Angeles. So I've always been lucky in the sense of if I ever have an idea or he has an idea, I'm able to get it executed. Um, and then, yeah, we, we just sort of put the stream out, I think on the 28th of December. 
and it, it managed to get a good reaction and then our agents in America picked up on it and managed to get us a deal with a big streaming service out in the USA for it to go out over St. Patrick's Day. So it's the same show that we we sold in December. So it was pre-recorded, but um, yeah, I mean, it's sort of, again, it's sort of taken us by surprise that the group started to get this kind of global appeal. And like, I was contacted there a couple of weeks ago by Tourism Ireland, who were like, Raymond, can we start sharing your videos around the world and stuff? And I was like, yeah. So like, I've been looking, my phone's been going this week and it's like the Irish embassy of Japan has just shared I Love Hope, I Love Tears. And I'm like, my God, you, you just don't know. Like you, like yeah. that was just a, game, a wee random idea. Cause I, oh, I'm really going full circle, but I was, I originally in December had planned to do a concert with another musical theater performer, Alistair Brammer mm -hmm. at St. Anne's Cathedral. But then when the new restrictions came in, it all got pulled apart. So I thought, fuck, I need to do something. I haven't done anything in nine months. And I've, I've seen the opportunity to do a streamed concert. And I thought, you've no excuse not to be doing anything else, Raymond. So yeah, that's sort of how that came about. But again, it just goes to show you, you may as well have a crack at doing something because it might something might come of it in the end. So that's it. Yeah, it's crazy. Um so so yeah with that concert you had set up a, a company called theatrical belfast and yeah that was see because it, it, it probably really helps the fact that you were in les mis and you'd, you'd met all these west end stars and become good friends with them so yeah you were able to be like okay and, and a lot of the time uh west end stars don't really come over here to do concerts yeah. like that and the talent that they have because i feel like the talent in the west end now just supersedes just years gone by people are just getting better and better yeah, uh, yeah. like the likes of uh rob who played marius in les yeah. is it's just unbelievable so so what what obviously you can't really plan in the future what you're going to do with that but what are you hoping that comes from that yeah but essentially what what you said there chris uh, you know the dream is to bring these uh these big massive stars and these huge talents and bring them over to Belfast and combine concerts with local talent and you know allow people maybe younger people from over here to believe that they too can aspire to this kind of level and that they deserve to be on the stage with these kind of people Do you know I as I say I always when I was younger remember looking up to everyone and looking up to the likes of Ramin Karim Lou and all and I thought god I'd love to see those people in concerts and you do, as you say, it's hard to get people over here. So I sort of felt, certainly through the Les Mis concert and things like that, I thought, oh, Raymond, you have an opportunity here to hopefully bring people over to Northern Ireland. And, uh, you know, I know Rob, he runs his own production company, West End Does, and they do big sort of West End concerts. So I'd love to work with him on something and maybe bring one of his concerts over here. And uh who knows i guess that but the plan is to be ambitious and to try to get uh things going again within the arts once we're able to so um i'm always one for taking a risk so i'll aim big and then see where about to fall fair enough uh so uh i just wanted to ask you what obviously this time we've had so much time free time what have you been watching listening to reading anything you would recommend what have I been watching this thing? So recently, uh, I've been watching The Serpent on BBC. It's brilliant. Uh, really, really good sort of crime drama. Uh, I binge watched myself and my girlfriend, Jolene, binge watched uh, Shit's Creek in no, no time whatsoever. So that was great. Uh, recently got into RuPaul's Drag Race, which is the best crack and absolutely uh, entertaining TV. Uh, I'm trying to think what else. Oh, there's been, to be fair, there's been a lot of great TV and a lot of great things uh, sort of come out over the last year. And uh, I loved Normal People as well. Thought that was great. Uh, and oh, geez, I'm trying to think. In terms of listening to you, I've got really into the 1975. Mm -hmm. I think uh, they're absolutely class. And then the old classics like Simply Red and Westlife. Can't beat uh, Westlife, like 
Oh, you really can't like, and they've just released yesterday that they're bringing out a new album. So, oh, really? Oh, I look forward to that. Maybe twenty one's not that bad. Not no, that absolutely bad. not. So, uh, just to finish off, I just want to ask you, um, what advice would you have for anyone looking in, looking to get into this industry, or maybe people who are already in it? Uh, just what what advice would you have for them to keep going and try their best? I would just say really believe in yourself and stick to your stick to your principles and also being a good person and being a kind person goes goes a really long way and you don't ever have to be something that you're not do you know I think actually what people value is people's individuality and I think in the end sometimes I was told maybe to tone down my Irish accent or you know do this or do that but actually in the end it was when I stopped caring what other people thought and went, do you know what? This is who I am. I'm just going to be myself. That's when things really started to happen for me because I wasn't, people can read if you're being fake or not being a true version of yourself. So I think, you know, stick to your principles, be a nice person. And also in the last couple of years, I'd say I've learned most create your own work as well. And, you know, do your own thing and be proactive and, you know, geez, I, I went four, five years without getting a musical theatre job. And it was only when I started to do things for myself that I was able to get the confidence back up. So believe, I'd say definitely believe in yourself and don't let anyone tell you that it's a bad idea to work in the arts because you never work a day in your life. Like That's you really it. don't. Absolutely. Raymond, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks so much for doing this. Thanks for uh, taking the time out to speak to me. I really appreciate it, your gem. Not a problem. I look forward to hopefully seeing you for a pint when this is all uh, this is all over. Absolutely. Hopefully, I'm on the right side of the bar. Yeah, and not having the say, I'm not gonna, I can't have you pouring me then. That's for sure. Definitely not. You don't want that. All right. <laughs> Thanks very much, mate. Cheers. Thanks a million, Chris. So you have it, folks. That was Raymond Walsh. Uh, make sure to check out Shamrock Tenors on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook because they're absolutely unreal, and all the tunes they sing are epic. So. Next week, well, should I say this week, I turn 25. So as a wee birthday special, we treat to you from me. Uh, I have a good friend of mine, Kieran McCourt, on the podcast, live, in person, in the makeshift studio here at Plan Pretend HQ. If you could, tell your friends about the podcast, like and subscribe to the video. This has been Plan Pretend with Chris McIlvenny. See you next week.